Church. Welcome to worship on this Sunday after Christmas. It's so delightful to be with all of you and to welcome all of you who are joining us online. We have one really exciting announcement as we get started this morning. Ash got her Christmas wish to have her baby. So Matt and Ash are welcoming Aisley Ann into our church family. Yes, yay, yay. She came last Wednesday, so I think they were able to be home for Christmas, and I know they would covet your prayers as they become a family of four. So, welcome to the world, baby Ansley. Okay, our call to worship this morning comes, and I'm going to read it from Isaiah 60. Arise, Jerusalem, let your light shine for all to see. For the glory of the Lord rises to shine on you. Darkness as black as night covers all the nations of the earth, but the glory of the Lord rises and appears over you. All nations will come to your light. Mighty kings will come to see your radiance. No longer will you need the sun to shine by day, nor the moon to give its light by night. For the Lord your God will be everlasting light. And your God will be your glory. Your sun will never set. Your moon will not go down. For the Lord will be your everlasting light. Your days of mourning will come to an end. Let's stand and sing Hark the Herald Angels together.
remain standing and let's recite the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, and he ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, and the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. be seated. I don't know if there are any kids in our midst, but we have Mike Clark joining us this morning and Sue, and they're going to do our children's sermon. So they may actually get, you could be like TV stars speaking into the camera, but if there are any young disciples who want to come forward, we welcome you to do so at this time. Thank you. Oh, we got one coming forward. <laughs> wonderful. And wonderful to all you children at home as well. We're going to talk about Christmas, and I have a couple of questions, so you're going to have to answer a lot of questions for her. All right? <laughs> Thanks, Dad. Appreciate it. <laughs> you know, we've just uh, had this great celebration just a few days ago, and this place was filled with so many children and so many people of all ages. And then after that, the next day was Christmas Day. And did you get some presents? Yeah. What was one present, Dad, that she got that she, you thought she really liked? Oh, Duplo building blocks are fantastic. We still use the same ones we got for our kids about 40 years ago. <laughs> for our grandchildren. They just, those things last forever. They're just a tremendous toy. And I'm sure if we could be talking to so many of the children uh, here and those at home, we'd be hearing about dolls and we'd be hearing about uh, beautiful clothes and we'd be hearing about different types of toys and all those wonderful things that children enjoy at Christmas time. The great gifts. Uh, it's just a tremendous tradition. And they're all really expressions of love. How about the great gift that we just shared a few moments ago when we saw the, the birth to Matt and Ash of that new Christmas baby? How about that? I mean, that will be a, a Christmas celebration that will change all the rest of their Christmas celebrations in many wonderful ways. I want to talk quickly about a wonderful celebration. That's all right. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. <laughs> a wonderful celebration that we experienced uh, a great gift in our lives a number of years ago. Uh, it was 43 years ago, just a few nights before Christmas, that I asked Sue if she'd be my bride. And she said yes, which was one of my very favorite Christmas gifts ever, because it's a gift that keeps on giving. We give our love to each other and share that. And uh, thank you so much, Sue, for saying yes that night, and that we could have that Christmas gift to share together. And of course, it's really about love and relationships that really makes Christmas and gift giving so special. And it's really because it started with the greatest gift of all time. And of course, every children's message, you know the answer to the question. So I'll ask you all, and you'll say it out loud. What's the greatest Christmas gift ever? Jesus. Jesus. So that's our Christmas message for today. Children at home, children throughout the world, rejoice with us in the gift of Christ. Thanks, Sue. Well, I'm glad to be here today. I'm Mike Clark. I'm not on staff here. Sue and I worship here. I was a pastor for over 40 years, and... Uh, 
originally, as some of you know already, was uh, a seminary intern and a member here way back in the 70s when I went to see you. I think it's interesting that they, the staff is, I'm sure, just exhausted after all the different services and everything they've been through. So they asked the old retired guy if he'd come out and give this message this morning. But I'm really happy to be here. And I'm happy that you came out and that you at home are listening and that we can be together today to really celebrate this. But, you know, it's been such a crazy time. Each year it seems that all the Christmas hoopla gets bigger and bigger and it takes forever and ever to get through all the ads. I think they're starting in August now. You know, to get ready for Christmas. And have you seen this one? Here is a, uh, a Christmas tradition turned upside down. So did any of you buy a tree like this? It's an upside down Christmas tree. And the, I, 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 according to the website, the idea is the inverted shape makes it easier to see the ornaments, which hang away from the denser needles, and allowing more room for the accumulation of presents underneath. So did anyone buy one this year, an upside down Christmas tree? You know, there are other Christmas trees, too, that they're trying to push on us. There's the half Christmas tree, so you push it up against the wall. Or even the, the quarter Christmas tree, you put it into the corner, and you get all that more room in, in your house. So, I don't know. The retailers keep uh, pestering us with all these things, and, and our Christmas season and Advent season gets more and more chaotic. So I hope that by now you are not tired of Christmas. The true Christmas, the joy of Christmas, celebrating the greatest gift, that birth of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Thanking God for his great mercy to send his only son to us. So this morning I want to help us continue this great Christmas celebration and think about how it's going to affect our lives from now on. We celebrate the coming of Jesus into our world, not just one time, but twice. I think you know that. We look back with great joy and remember when Christ first came into our world as our Messiah, our Savior, and showed us the love of God. He was God's in love personified. He lived out God's love, grace, and mercy to us all. But we also look forward to that day on the triumphant return of Christ into our world as he comes again. And in that day, he's going to usher in a new age, a new eternal kingdom of God. We look forward to that time in which the Bible promises there'll be no more sorrow, no more evil, pain, suffering, no death of any kind, no tears even. We look forward to the days of constant joy, complete peace, deep fulfillment, and eternal, total satisfaction. In that kingdom, we will experience the greatness of our eternal God. We will see him face to face, as the book of Revelations. And those are going to be wonderful days. I look forward to those days, and I hope you do as well. But it all had to begin on that Christmas day long ago. When will that time come of Jesus' second coming? There's a lot of discussion about that. Have been many, many times over the years. When will the kingdom of God come with the Christ? We pray for it every time we pray the Lord's Prayer, don't we? We pray, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So, will the kingdom come only after the second coming of Christ? After the end of the days of this world that we know? Or are we already in some way experiencing the kingdom of God today? In other words, is Christmas that we celebrated so long ago and remember from then a larger, greater celebration than we ever thought about and expected. Jesus told his disciples in Mark 9, 1, Truly I tell you, some of you who are standing here will not taste death before they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. Now this statement from Jesus has caused a lot of doubts among people because they look at what Jesus said and they said, wait a minute, those disciples, or those people that heard him say that, they're long gone and yet the kingdom doesn't seem to have come back. So was Jesus telling us the truth? Can we trust Jesus and what he said? The world's been turning almost 2,000 years after Jesus said that statement. What did Jesus really mean? Well, if we search 
for clues in other statements Jesus made about the kingdom, I think we'll begin to understand what he was talking about. According to Jesus, the kingdom of God seems insignificant at first, but then it grows and grows and grows almost secretly with great and irrepressible power. In Mark 4, 26 to 29, Jesus said it this way, This is what the kingdom of God is like, a man scattered seed on the ground, night or day, whether he sleeps or gets up. The seed sprouts and the seed grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel of the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. How many of you are gardeners? Let's see a show of hands. Isn't it amazing to watch the plants grow from just a few small seeds and turn into large, large plants? My wife and I, early in our marriage, we lived in Pennsylvania in a house that was amidst a cornfield. And at the start of the year, the farmer came and he sowed the seeds, started the agricultural time. And we watched those corn seeds grow into tall stalks, taller than our heads. It wasn't just knee high by the 4th of July, it was over our heads in August. It was so amazing how fast that corn grew. A huge tree starts with a small seed, maybe a, an acorn, and it turns into a large, large tree. I've got a little simulated time-lapse video of a tree growing from a small seed. It's just amazing to think about what happens in this creation of God. Let me show you that now. You can imagine. It would take some years, but not that many. For a tree to become that which is full, filled with birds, producing its own seeds, giving shade to those who would rest among it. Isn't that amazing? Jesus tells us the kingdom of God comes in small ways, but like seeds that grow into big trees, these small ways become really huge. Once Jesus sows the eternal kingdom, the growth of it begins to happen, breaking out in areas and ways where we least expect it to come. Tiny results show first in small ways, then growth multiplies and life happens, developing into harvests of God's goodness. Jesus tells us that this inevitable kingdom growth rises up and it cannot be stopped, my friends. It cannot be stopped. In Mark 4, 30 to 32, Jesus said, What shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It's like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants, such, with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shades. The common mustard seed of Palestine is the black mustard, which you see here. It was the smallest seed known to the people of Jesus' time. It takes about 750 mustard seeds to, to weigh a single ounce. Yet one small seed can grow into a tree over 12 feet high. Birds do find shelter in it. People can rest under its shade. So what Jesus is telling us is watch out. If the kingdom of God comes so secretly yet powerfully, it is already growing. It has been growing for over 2,000 years. It is exerting its amazing influence upon our lives and upon our world that has changed it forever. And isn't that the truth? Isn't that what we've seen? Has the kingdom of God already come among us here on earth as it is in heaven? In many ways, yes. Jesus was not wrong. He proclaimed that the kingdom of God has come among us in Mark 1.15 when he said, The time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. When he says the kingdom of God has come near, the sense of that 
Greek word is that it is in our very midst. You see, what we often fail to hear is this wonderful news at Christmas is that where the king is, so is the kingdom. Have you thought of that? Even when Jesus was a small baby laying there, he was still the king, and the kingdom had already come. It was among us. So when Jesus, when he came the first time, the kingdom of God began to grow. And we don't have to wait to experience some of the blessings of that kingdom among us now. In his first coming, we began to experience kingdom life. Jesus explains this, how he set out his disciples to heal in Luke 10, 9. But he said, heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. And the disciples did that. And they watched in amazement as people were healed. He explained another sign of God's kingdom in Matthew 12, 28. He said, but if it is by the spirit of God that I, I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And that happened. In Luke 7, 22, Jesus said, So he replied to John, the messengers of John, Go back and report to John. What you have seen, what you have heard, the blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. All these miracles and these signs point to the presence of the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and he brings his kingdom among us, not just then, but today, as we watch today his miracles unfolding in our world and in our lives and in our churches. The kingdom's already here in so many ways. You know, one of the Christmas names for Jesus is Emmanuel, which means literally God with us. In the first coming of Jesus, God came to live among us. God in the flesh came to know our trials, our sufferings, our difficulties. He came to sympathize, to empathize, to revitalize our lives. He did this through establishing a personal relationship with us in his love and mercy and grace. God with us, men and women, Savior to us all. In the land of Persia, there once ruled a very wise and benevolent, loving Shah. He cared greatly for his people. He desired only what was best for them. One day he disguised himself as a poor man and he went to visit the public baths. The water for the baths was heated down below in a furnace in the cellar. So the Shah made his way down into that dark place to sit with the man who tended the fire. The two men shared the coarse food and the Shah befriended this man in his loneliness. Often the ruler went to visit this man, and the worker became attached to this stranger because he came where he was. One day the Shah revealed his true identity, and he expected the man to ask for a gift, which is what so many did in his presence. Instead, the man looked long into his beloved ruler's face, and with love and wonder in his voice, he said, You left your palace and your glory. You came to sit with me here in this dark place, you ate my coarse food. You cared about what happens to me. On others you may bestow your gifts, but to me you gave yourself. Jesus came to give us himself. He left his heavenly place to come into our world. We have the ruler of the universe here among us. In him, the benefits of his kingdom have begun to grow here among us now. In the second coming of Christ, Jesus will return as the exalted one, the God over everything and everyone. And in a harmonious rule, nothing will stop him. All will bend down and worship him. But the kingdom that he began has already begun to grow among us. As we live and trust in Jesus as our Lord and our Savior, we have Jesus and with Jesus we have the King and his kingdom. The kingdom is here among the followers of Jesus in Boulder. The kingdom of God began with a small-scale invasion of a third world country. Jesus established his beachhead among his first disciples, just a hand few, handful. They shared Jesus' love. They, they saw his grace, and they in turn shared it with others. So just a group of 12 and 70 and hundreds and thousands that saw him in Palestine, in Israel. Now, 
Do you realize there are near one billion followers of Jesus in our world? That's a force to be reckoned with, isn't it? That's a kingdom power that can greatly influ influence communities, regions, countries, and world. Only the church of Jesus Christ is powerful enough to overcome this world's problems as Jesus sends us out in his name, in his spirit, by his power. Only the church of Jesus can transform lives to the greater purpose God intends for us all. This Christmas season, don't underestimate the power of the church and the presence of the kingdom among us. The kingdom is within those who follow Jesus. Jesus explained this in Luke 17, 20 to 21. The coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed, nor will people say, here it is, or there it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst. The kingdom is among us with those who follow Jesus. The kingdom grows in our world and in our lives. It grows in our church and in our community. Count on Jesus to continue what he began to completion. Realize this, the kingdom does not depend on any of us, but God has given us the great gift of being part of sharing that good news, that kingdom. The kingdom of God is all about Jesus. If we concentrate on him, we can watch what happens. So don't get so busy with all the trappings and traditions of Christmas that you miss the point of what we did all that celebrating for. That the kingdom of God is with us in Jesus. British playwright Sir Barry James Matthew, best known for his children's fantasy, Peter Pan. He liked to tell the story of a small boy who had, had given a seat in his author's box to watch his play. At the end, he asked the small boy which of the bits of the play he liked the best. And the boy replied, what I think I liked best was tearing up the program and dropping the bits on the people's heads. <laughs> because he was up above in the box, he could take his play brochure and tear it apart, drop the bits down, but he missed the play because he was so involved in his other activities. Don't waste the message of Christmas on foolish things, on things that do not last. A number of years ago, the story is told of a man in North Carolina who picked up a very beautiful rock he found in a North Carolina stream bed. He used it as a doorstop for his cabin. Years later, a geologist, geologist was hiking in the area. He stopped at the cabin. He looked at that doorstop and he realized it was a huge lump of gold. It actually happened. It proved to be one of the largest gold nuggets ever found east of the Rockies. He was using it as a doorstop. We have the kingdom of God among us, and often we don't realize its great value. The kingdom of God is among us as we live in and for our King Jesus. He descended that we might ascend. He became poor that we might become rich. He was born that we might be born again. He became a servant that we might become sons and daughters of God. He had no home that we might have an eternal home in God's kingdom. He was hungry that we might be fed. He was thirsty that we might be satisfied. He was stripped that we might be clothed. He was forsaken that we would never be forsaken. He was sad that we would become glad. He was made sin that we might be made righteous and holy in his sight through his blood. He died that we would live eternal and abundant life. He came down that we might be caught up into God's eternal kingdom. The Lord's Prayer does teach us to ask that the kingdom and will of God be done here on earth as it is in heaven. And the more we focus on Jesus, our King, in this life, the more that comes about. And we see God living in and through us. The more we dedicate our lives to God, the more we become royal children of God the Father, with our brother Jesus leading the way, and the Spirit empowering us to live that way. And so thus, the more the kingdom of God comes among us, the more 
we can experience that kingdom. Are you ready today to dedicate your lives again, or maybe for the first time, to Jesus Christ as our King? To be His citizens of that kingdom. I pray that we will experience the full wonder and majesty of our great King with us, God with us, Jesus. I pray we will honor Him with our lives from now on in this new year that is to come. That we will share His gifts with those around us. So I ask you to pray with me. Lord Jesus, as we prepare to celebrate your birthday, we dedicate our lives to you in this season of Christmas. You shared with us the greatest gift of all, your life given for us so that we can live with you forever in joy and peace. Help us to share this gift with all around us because it's a gift that was meant to be shared, not hoarded. Empower this church by your spirit, Lord, so we can bring to others our Christmas joy. Help every person here not only to receive your gift of love in Jesus, but also to share that love with our neighbors and friends. So now, Lord, I ask each one here to personally and those at home pray with me this prayer. Lord Jesus, you are our king. We praise you for coming into our world. We thank you for being our Lord and our Savior. Thank you for changing our lives. So we dedicate our lives to you. We ask that your Holy Spirit empower us to be your representatives this Christmas and in the new year. We love you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Oh, Lord. 
I think that was our prayer. <laughs> what a gift you give us. Thank you, Randy, so much. Uh, a bit more family news to share. This past week, James McCory has gone home to be with the Lord. Service times are pending, so stay tuned for those details. Let's join our hearts now together in prayer. Good morning, Lord. We pause to bask in your presence. And we gather our hearts and we pray along the lines of the hymn, Joy to the World. Father, you have made joy possible because of Jesus. He has come to us. Let earth receive her king. As promised so many years ago, everything changed the night you sent your son to be born into your creation. Would you help us now to receive Jesus? our King. Let every heart prepare him room. Father God, you made our hearts to be filled with you. And yet, more often than not, we leave no room for you in our hearts and in our lives. Forgive us. Thank you that you do forgive us, and we ask God that you would help us Help us in fresh ways to prepare him room. Help us, God, in this new year to make time, to make space in our days. Make room for him. And heaven and nature sing. Lord God, like heaven and nature, we need to sing. Sing your praises. Sing of your faithfulness. Sing of your goodness and your majesty. Lord, let our songs employ, along with the fields and the floods, rocks, hills, and plains, so that together we can repeat the sounding joy. Joy to the world, the Savior reigns. And we pray this morning that it be here on earth as it is in heaven, and that you, Jesus, would reign. We need a Savior, and we want you, Jesus, on the throne. And we ask that you would help us submit and surrender to your reign. He comes to make his blessings flow. Gracious Father, your blessings are so abundant. Would you give us fresh eyes to see them? And would you help us live lives that allow your flow to bless others through us. 
He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove. O oh Lord, we need you to rule this world. Only you rule with truth and grace and make your nations prove. We pray this morning that you would move in our midst, that you would come and rule here in Boulder, rule in our country, and oh, Jesus, please rule our world. We ask God this morning that as your people and your billion people across the globe would be called by your name, we would know the truth and the grace that you give us, that you would empower us to make an impact in your kingdom here on earth. God, empower us with your love that we might honor and love others. Lord, help us in our actions as we partner with you to bring your good news. And glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love, Jesus, keep us alive to your wonders. Inspire us with your righteousness. Set us free with your love. We bless you for coming to show us the way and for the life-altering gift you gave us in your spirit that guides us. Joy to the world, our Lord has come. And together now we all give voice in praying the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Would you please stand? Let's sing our final song together. today. We're going to go and proclaim that message. We're going to take it out to the world. We want to give special thanks for your generosity. Again, as you probably all well know, that on your way out, you'd like to give an offering into the offering boxes. Please do that. If you're at home, you can do that online. 
But now go with the gifts of God. For God in his love, God the Father in his great love, gave his only Son, that all who would believe in him will have eternal life. Go in the love of God the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the joy and abundant life of his Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.